Well, good evening to you. It's a pleasure to be back this year. I was, I was gone last year, got a new job, and was not able to, to make the trip last year, so it's good to be home, especially good to be home under the circumstances of, of the storm, and Ada and I out in Southern California were, were watching television that night, uh, obviously concerned and, and praying, and uh, we were so thankful that the Lord protected all of you who live here in Joplin, both our, our earthly family and our heavenly family, that all of you were kept in the hands of the Lord. So we're very, we're very, we're very thankful to be here uh, under those circumstances and to see, to see all of you. It's been uh, pleasant for us to be together this week. It, it always ends too soon, these meetings. Uh, but we're going to try to end it tonight on a, on a high note here. My text is in Isaiah chapter 53. The topic is, he died a vicarious death. Remember, we're speaking about the things that Christ has accomplished on our behalf. And I'm going to just begin by reading this passage. It's such an incredible passage, a prophecy about the sufferings of our Lord. So vivid. Isaiah 53, 4 through 6. Surely... He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He died a vicarious death. I, I want to begin just by defining that important term in the title of the message, vicarious. It's, it's not a term that you hear every day. It, uh, it's not a term that we read in the pages of Scripture. I'm not aware of any of the, the translations that use that term. It's not in the Bible, but the doctrine is in the Bible. The word vicarious is actually a Latin term. It it means, and I think the most simplest way to understand it is a substitute. Jesus died as a substitute. And the word also has the connotation of a benefit that is derived from this substitution. So it's not like just somebody getting substituted in a ball game or something like that. There's some kind of of important benefit that comes from from this substitution. It's a word that is very closely related to the word sacrifice. Very closely related. As Brother Al mentioned this morning in his message, there's the word vicar in vicarious. And that word vicar, has, has been a misused concept by one element of the church, but the word vicar kind of means a representative. So that's another way to understand vicarious. Jesus is our representative. He is our substitute. He is our sacrifice. Now I've heard a lot of sermons on the cross and the death of Christ, and I've heard preachers try to give illustrations and analogies to capture the essence of this vicarious death. And I've noticed, I've, I'm going to give you a couple of examples here of some illustrations I've heard. It's not that these, these illustrations are heretical or anything like that, but I want to illustrate for you how difficult it is, really, to capture in a single analogy everything that went into Jesus becoming a vicarious, him dying a vicarious death. I've, for example, I heard a preacher who compared this, and I don't remember all the details of this illustration, but he said the vicarious nature of Christ's death was something like a father who is working on the railroad and for some reason his son gets caught in the train tracks and there's a train coming and he has to make a choice between saving his son or saving the people on the train and so he makes the decision to save the people on the train and allows his son to die. Okay? I've heard it compared to a soldier who sacrifices himself in combat to save his comrades. Particularly, I heard this in a sermon right after the movie Saving Private Ryan came out. 
And the preacher said it's just like what they were doing there in the World War II movie when they were trying to get Private Ryan out of enemy territory and they gave their lives for uh, that man. That's what Jesus did. He gave his life for us. But, but those, those comparisons and others are inadequate for a number of reasons. I'll just list a few here of why these are inadequate. Number one, the sacrifice, the sacrifice described in those illustrations was not preordained. Jesus' was. This is not God reacting. This is not God suddenly deciding that he needs a vicarious sacrifice. Oh, I hadn't thought of that before. Maybe I should try that. That's not what this is at all. This was preordained. Secondly, those illustrations are inadequate because the sacrifices, at least in those examples, were not for the enemies or somebody who was wicked. And the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus died for the ungodly. Jesus didn't die for good people. He died for sinners. And thirdly, those, those examples, those particular examples are inadequate because the one who dies does not recover. And let's not forget that when we talk about Jesus dying, he rose again. He recovered. You see, Christ's death is unique. There's really nothing else like it. We can compare other things to it, but it's difficult to compare it to other things because it's unique. Jesus is unique. His death is unique. He he died like no one else died. I'm not saying he wasn't the only person to be crucified. There were two other men who were crucified with him, but we don't worship them. We, We worship Christ because of the uniqueness of his death. One, one writer did come very close, though, to giving us an analogy of exactly what Jesus did in this vicarious death. C.S. Lewis in the Chronicles of Narnia, those of you who are readers, recall how Aslan, the king and the creator of Narnia, offers himself to die for Edmund, and Edmund was a traitor. Edmund had been wicked. He had betrayed his brothers and sisters. And Aslan offers himself in the place of the traitor, the wicked traitor. That comes a little closer to what Jesus did for us on the cross. Now whatever I say after this, whether or not I do a good job of expressing and explaining these concepts and these truths to you, I want you to know that whatever I might say or whatever I might leave out, whatever you might not understand... The atonement, the vicarious death of Jesus, works. Whether I explain it adequately or not, whether you understand everything about it or not, it works. It is effective. We know that it works. How it works is a little more complex. It's kind of like trying to explain how a car gets you from point A to point B. You know that you can go out, get in your car, turn the key, and drive from point A to point B. But, un- but describing all of the systems of the car and how it works, well, that's a little more complex. And that's one of the things that we're doing here is we're opening this up. We're trying to show you different facets of how this worked, how God has saved us. But, but just be assured, it does work His death has effectively paid for sin, and if you believe in it, it will take you to heaven. And that's the important thing. Now, you may not know this, but Christians, Christian people who love Jesus and love the Bible, have not always emphasized the same thing when they talk about the death of Christ and how it works. For example, some, some Christians in the past have said that the main thing about Jesus' death that he accomplished was victory over the devil. Now, the, if you have the opportunity to read any of the early church fathers, those men who lived and wrote and led the church right after the death of the apostles, this, was, this is what they emphasized, that Jesus died to gain the victory over the devil. Now, is that found in Scripture? Yes. Yes, it is. Hebrews 2, 14 to 15 says, Since therefore... The children share in flesh and blood. He himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So did Jesus die to win the victory over the devil? Yes. 
He did. We've, we've already expounded that. Unfortunately, though, there was an emphasis that was taught, and I don't know if this is taught a lot today, but it had been taught in the past that, that Jesus actually paid off the devil, that the ransom was paid to the devil. And, and uh, even C.S. Lewis in the Chronicles of Narnia kind of takes that route in the images that he paints in those, in those books. But that is not what the scripture teaches. The devil didn't need to be paid off. We weren't in trouble ultimately with the devil. Our issue was with God. And we'll, talk, we'll unpack that. And so that view can kind of make an unbiblical dualism where the devil is as powerful as God. And that's certainly not what the scripture teaches. A second way that, that the death of Christ has been expounded by the church is that the vicarious death of Jesus is a demonstration of the love of God. And this is by far the most popular understanding of the atonement today. Most people in the church, if you ask them, why did Jesus die? They would say, to show me how much God loves me. Now, is there a connection in Scripture between the love of God and the death of Christ? Yes, there, there definitely is. Romans 5, 8. God shows us his love for us. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We sing a, a, a wonderful hymn that is based on this view of the atonement. When I survey the wondrous cross. One of the lines says, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Now one problem with this view, if this is the only view of Christ's death that's emphasized, there's a couple of problems that can arise here with this limited view. One, it makes us the center of the universe. And we're not the center of the universe. God is. And this makes the effect of the cross subjective. This view makes the most important thing about the cross what you feel about the cross. And while that's important, it is much more important what God feels about the cross. So there's a third way that Christians have viewed the significance of Christ's death on the cross. And that's as a payment for sin. This was the main view of the Reformers. This is a, the view mostly developed by Paul in the New Testament. And this is the view that is developed by the prophet Isaiah in our text. And I, I'm going to say that while these other views do have elements of truth in them, that this is the most important way for us to see the significance of his death. Amen. This was a payment for sin. A payment to satisfy the righteousness of God. It could be viewed both as a payment or as a penalty that was suffered because of sin to satisfy the righteousness of God. And so Paul in Romans chapter 3 develops this thought, this understanding of the cross using two words. One word is the word propitiation, which we've referenced this week. And the other word is the word redemption. Here's what he says in Romans 3, 22 to 25. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption. There's the key word that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. Christ's death was a propitiation. It was a turning aside of the wrath of God that Jesus took the penalty that our sins deserved. The, the cross was a redemption. Redemption was accomplished. A payment was made. All that also that we could be justified. Or declared righteous in the sight of God. What's really at stake here. Is the righteousness and the holiness of God. The question is how can a righteous God. Make unrighteous people righteous. Without compromising his own character. That's what's at stake here. And the answer to that question is a substitute. Amen. The English scholar John Stott writes, The gospel is God's good news. Is, the gospel is good news about God's righteous way of making the unrighteous 
righteous. God's righteous way of making the unrighteous righteous. That's the issue involved. And I want you to understand that this is a concept that is distasteful to our culture. It is a concept that is even distasteful to many churches and many people in churches. Let me just summarize here real quickly before I move on. There are three different ways we can look at the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. One way is how his death affected the devil. Another way is how his death affects us. And the third way, and I'm going to argue the superior way, the way that Isaiah is writing about in his prophecy, is how Christ's death affected God for our ultimate good and our benefit. We're we're in there, you understand. We're included in there. Again, I repeat, the central question is how to be accepted by a righteous God. How can sinful, unrighteous people be accepted by a righteous God? That's the question. That's what's at stake. And again, this is the most countercultural view, how Jesus' death affected God. There is a sense in which Jesus died for God. Let me just take a moment here and digress just, just a minute to ask this question. Why is this particular view so unpopular today? There are people who reject this idea that Jesus was punished for our sins for various reasons. There are people who say that that's a, it's a pagan idea, or it's a primitive idea, it's not worthy of our consideration. Why is this view so unpopular today? And I'm, I'll give you two reasons why I believe that it is unpopular. One reason is, is people do not take sin seriously today. This has been mentioned repeatedly during our meeting. People simply do not think that sin is all that big of a deal. But the Bible takes sin very seriously. The consequences of sin are immense and far-reaching. This same prophet Isaiah said to the people of Judah in chapter 59 verse 2, Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Sounds serious to me. Sin does have consequences. Sin has really created a separation between God and man. And God really does react to sin. You can think of sin as cosmic rebellion. And we know that God is the unquestioned sovereign of the universe. We know that Satan at one time rebelled against God and suffered the consequences. There is no chance... That a righteous and holy God will allow rebellion to go unaddressed in his universe. God is not neutral about sin. A second reason why people have rejected this idea that that Jesus died for our sins. That's the primary view and that God actually punished him for our sins. The second reason people reject that is because people today do not believe in the biblical God. John Calvin said the human mind is an idol factory. And so people today have created a God that is not the God revealed in Scripture to suit their own fancies. And that is not a new thing. Read Romans chapter 1. That throughout uh, all of history, sinful humanity has rejected the knowledge of God and chosen instead to worship gods that they have made, that they have created. Well, the first thing I want you to see about Isaiah's prophecy and the vicarious sacrifice of our Lord is that this this very, if I may call it a concept, this very idea, this very concept of saving us through a vicarious death is a provision of God. In other words, this this is not an arrangement that human beings made with God. This is not an agreement where we went to God and said, Lord, we have an idea. We would like to present to you the sin problem. Why don't we kill some animals, bring the blood, do this and that? And the Lord said, you know, that's a pretty good idea. Let's give that a try. That's not how this worked. (laughs) This is not a, a human idea. This is a divine provision. This is, if you will, this is God's idea. This is God's way of saving sinners. 
And, and what I want you to see is that this is actually the grace of God. This is, this is how we see the grace of God, that he is the one providing this sacrifice. He is the one providing this way of getting rid of our sin. Many people who have studied the Bible have said that there is a scarlet thread weaving its way through Scripture. A scarlet thread of redemption, blood, death, sacrifice on almost every page of Scripture. Go back to the very beginning of human history after the man and the woman sinned in the garden. The Lord used the skin of animals to cover their nakedness. Blood was shed, animals died to cover their nakedness. After they failed, by the way, important detail, to cover it themselves. So from the very beginning of human history, blood was shed to cover man's shame and disgrace. A a principle is being established in Scripture. Under the old dispensation of the law, thousands upon thousands of animals were sacrificed to make a covering or an atonement for the people's sins. The priesthood was established. A tabernacle was built there in the wilderness. God himself was preparing a way for their sins to be forgiven. In Leviticus 17, verse 11, the Lord said to the people of Israel, The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you. Note that. I have given it for you. See, this is God's provision. On the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. So a principle is being established. The law is doing its job as a tutor. The way of atonement is something provided by the Lord. In other words, the Lord is choosing graciously to accept the blood of bulls and goats and lambs for the people's sin. Now understand, God could have said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demand your blood for your sin. He could have done that. And he would have been perfectly right to do that. So this is a gracious provision that the Lord is saying, instead of you dying which is what you deserve, I am going to allow you to put forth a substitute for your sins. And so substitutes were provided and graciously accepted by the Lord for the people's sins. Now, the law, of course, was never made to make men perfect. The law was given to teach us about sin and atonement for sin. The people were being taught that the Lord was graciously willing to accept a substitute for their sin. All in preparation for the coming of Christ. Now some people have asked this question, was the God of Israel some bloodthirsty deity? Some have been offended by this. Was the Lord just a bloodthirsty deity like all the nations Idols of the nations that they worshipped in fear? And the answer very simply is no, because the Bible tells us that God was never satisfied by the blood of bulls and goats. Hebrews 10.4, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. God knew that. God knew that when he gave this old system. The blood of these animals was a shadow of what was to come in Christ, which is the message of the book of Hebrews And so it was nearly seven centuries after Isaiah gave this prophecy about one who would be led like a lamb to the slaughter. Seven centuries later, John the Baptist looked up and saw Jesus coming toward him. And in a moment of prophetic insight and fulfillment, the Baptist cried out, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All those lambs that shed their blood were only a shadow of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And so at the end of the Bible, in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, John looks into heaven and the story of redemption reaches its climax as John the Revelator sees into heaven, he sees a lamb looking as if it had been slain, sharing the very throne of God in cosmic victory. One thing the scriptures want to make very clear 
is that this victorious atonement was made through the death of Christ, a lamb that was slain, and not through any human activity or achievement. God provided the lamb. God provided the way. Just as he had done for Abraham on Moriah so many centuries before. And so Abraham had called God Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. The Lord provided the sacrifice for Abraham. The Lord provided a way for Israel to be holy in his presence and not die. And brothers and sisters, the death of Christ is effective because it is God's provision. The atonement made on the cross saves sinners because it is God's chosen way to save sinners. Scandalous though it might be to some. God's way is always effective. God doesn't give us a broken way, a way that might not work, and you never know if it'll work or not. It always works. If you come to God through Jesus Christ, you'll be received. Amen. It's an effective way. It's a, it's a new and living way, always effective. Man's efforts, on the other hand, will always come short. It's always in the nature of sinful man to reject God's provision and attempt to make his own way. This is why we have religion. This is why we have self-righteousness. People are rejecting God's way, rejecting God's provision, and attempting to create their own way and their own righteousness. And the Bible tells us that 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 is the case because of pride, because of human pride. And so it's no surprise that God makes the way of redemption a cross, to undercut human pride. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. That he, he's humbling the pride and the wisdom of man by making a way of redemption through, of all things, a cross. You can read 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 31. When I think about how many people reject God's provision and God's way of salvation, I think of that story of Naaman the leper. You remember the story of Naaman? That Syrian general, the, the pagan man who heard about Elisha, the healer in Israel, and he had leprosy. And so he went to Israel and he went to Elisha to be healed. And Elisha told him, well, you'll be healed if you go dip in the Jordan seven times. And Naaman went home mad. Why should I do a silly thing like that? There's, there are rivers in my home country that are a lot better than the Jordan. Why should I dip in the Jordan seven times? And he's on his way home, and I believe it was his servant that said, you know, Lord, if uh, he'd asked you to do something difficult, you'd have done it. Why don't you just go and do it? And so Naaman went, and he said, I'll, I'll do it. And he went, and he dipped seven times, and he was cleansed. Why was the water of Jordan the source of cleansing for Naaman? Because that was the way decreed by the Lord. And it was Naaman's responsibility to take that way and to obey the word of the Lord. You see, there is no other way for us to come to God other than the way that he has made. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Acts 4.12, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. So what I'm saying is simply this, that God has made a way for sinners to be cleansed, and it's through a vicarious death, and there is no other way. This is God's provision. We dare not refuse the provision of the Lord in order to make our own way. Only God's way is acceptable and only God's provision is effectual. Amen. So this is God's provision. Now the heart of this passage is that there is an innocent one who suffers. There is an innocent party that suffers for a guilty party. This prophecy focuses on someone who is called a servant, the servant of the Lord. And he is one who suffers for the people of God. He doesn't suffer for his own sin. He suffers for the people's sins. He is innocent, yet he suffers for the people's sin. Now, it is not an insignificant detail in the Gospels that Jesus was declared innocent by the very men who killed him. Repeatedly, Pilate, the man who actually gave him over to be killed, on several occasions 
declare Jesus to be innocent. I find no basis for a charge against him. I think he said it a total of three times. I find no basis for a charge against him. I find, nope, this is Pilate. He's not a Jew. He's not a believer in God. He's a pagan man. He is totally pragmatic. He just wants Jesus out of the way. He wants the Jews out of his hair. I find no basis for a charge against him. That's a significant detail in light of Isaiah's prophecy. He was innocent. Ironically, the placard above his head read the only charge brought against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. And that wasn't a sin because he was. The centurion who was there in command when Jesus was crucified. Another pagan man in charge of the death of these three men that day. Two criminals and the Lord himself testified that surely this was a righteous man. If those aren't enough examples, one of the criminals hanging there beside him said, This man has done nothing wrong. He recognized, he said to his cohort, We deserve this. This man has done nothing wrong. And so the scriptures testify, coming from people who really had no personal interest in what was going on, that he was a lamb without any spot or wrinkle or blemish. He was uniquely qualified, you see, to be our substitute because he himself was innocent. I'll go even further. He was uniquely qualified to be our substitute because he was both the Son of God and a man. He could stand between both. He could be our substitute because he was one of us. He took up our humanity. The word became flesh. But he was God and so he was holy. He was blameless. He was sinless and pure and could be the bearer of our sins. This is why he could recover. The Lord struck him, but the Lord also raised him on the third day. Now let's look even close, more closely now at this passage, what it says, clearly says and shows us about the vicarious nature of Christ's death. Notice just the words in the text. The prophet speaks of our grief, our sorrows, our transgressions, our iniquities, the iniquity of us all. We have gone astray and we have turned. That's our side. That's our part. Notice the various ways he describes our condition. All of these sins and spiritual sicknesses belong to us, not to him. But now notice... On the other side, how these things were transferred, vicariously taken by him. The text says, he has borne and carried. He was wounded. He was crushed. Upon him was the chastisement. It says, laid on him, our sins laid on him. The Lord has laid on him. He was our substitute. And we weren't there to lend any support or help. He did this by himself. Amen. Isaiah also mentions the results of this substitution. He brought us peace. We are healed. Do you begin to understand the nature of a vicarious death? This is pictured, of course, in Leviticus 16, the Day of Atonement. By the scapegoat image. Jesus is our scapegoat. Jesus is also the strong man that took the scapegoat out into the wilderness and then returned. The sins are laid on the head of the scapegoat. The scapegoat is taken away from the people. That's vicarious. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He became sin for us vicariously. The penalty then of our sins is imputed to him. Instead of being imputed to us. He took the consequences for our sin. And all his suffering shows the effect of sin on humanity. It's interesting that when the gospel writer Matthew shows the fulfillment of our text. 
it is in the context of a physical healing. It's in Matthew 8, 14 to 17. It says, Jesus entered Peter's house and saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she rose and began to serve him. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Here's our text. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. I gather from that that the gospel writer is saying that that these healings was a part of his bearing our sin. John Calvin says, From the moment when he assumed the form of a servant, he began in order to redeem us to pay the price of deliverance. Now I understand that it was on the cross, that's that's where the focus was. Everything was moving in that direction when he would die. We're talking about a vicarious death, but there is still something to be said for the fact that even when he became flesh, he began to carry the penalty simply by becoming flesh. He began to carry our sin in some sense. Simply by doing what Paul said he did in Philippians 2, that he considered it not... uh, He humbled himself. He did not hang on to his former estate. He humbled himself and became, just like it says in our passage, a servant. It's interesting that Peter later quotes from our text as well. After witnessing Jesus heal his mother-in-law and all those people that he heals, Peter later writes in his letter, 1 Peter 2, 24-25, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but, we have, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You see, sickness in the body is also a consequence of sin. It's, it's sort of like a visible reminder of the sickness in our souls. And so when Jesus healed sick bodies, it was a sign of the kingdom of God and a sign of the cosmic healing that the Savior will eventually bring to this world. His healing will go as far as the curse. And so the Lord came to bring a total, not a partial, salvation. His suffering went to the root of all human suffering. Now, at this present time, we have not seen the completion of this healing. We're still in these bodies, but we have the hope of glory. You see, Jesus suffered all the consequences for all of our sin. This included suffering the very wrath of God. And this part of the passage might push our understanding into some new areas of thought. The passage clearly says and states that God, God was the source of his suffering. Now notice what the prophet says. And this language is very precise. Notice that the prophet says he would be stricken, smitten by who? By God and afflicted. Again, he says that he would be, he says it twice. He says stricken, smitten by God, afflicted. Then he says it again, smitten by by God. By his own father. Now what are we to make of this? Some have said maybe he's speaking metaphorically. But he isn't. Because when Jesus died. He cried out. My God. My God. Why have you forsaken me? Quoting from Psalm 22. Because it was at that moment in time. When the father focused his wrath on the son. And Jesus was bearing our sin. And Jesus became a lightning rod for the wrath of God. Last month, my hometown suffered one of the worst storms in the history of our country. But I want you to know that Jesus went through a worse storm. The worst tornado in in the history of the world hit Jesus while he was on the cross. As God focused his wrath on Jesus. It's no, mo- it's no wonder that at the moment when he was bearing our sins. Our sin. As brother Vic put it last night. Very precisely. Our sin. All of it. 
the sun itself refused to give its light. And this great vicarious death was shrouded in darkness. Hebrews 2.9 says, He tasted death for us. So that we would not have to die is, is the meaning. And this principle had already been established under the law. The principle of sacrifice. That something or someone dies so that someone else does not have to die. Someone dies so that someone else can live. Someone dies so that someone else can go free. He tasted death. The Hebrew writer actually says he destroyed death by dying. Amen. That was the cup that he prayed would pass. That was what was in that cup. Tasting death for every man, the scripture says. More than just physical suffering. And, and physical death. It was a separation from the Father. The wages of sin is death. Death is the punishment for sin. Separation from God. And I don't want to go too far and speak beyond what the scripture says. But there is a sense in which Jesus experienced what hell is on the cross. Separation from God. That's why the old apostles creed says he descended into hell. It's not that Jesus went into the lake of fire. But he was separated for a time from his father. And that is how hell is described as the second death. Separation from God. See, he, he went through hell, if you will, so that we wouldn't have to. Vicarious death. You know, all those psalms that talk about, I think this was mentioned today. One of the psalms, maybe several of the psalms, talk about the Lord being our shield. Remember those images from the Psalms? The Lord is my shield. Well, think about this for a moment. What does a shield do? It takes the blow. Now think about that in terms of Jesus and what we're talking about and what Jesus accomplished on the cross. He is our shield. He takes the blow for us so that we wouldn't have to take that blow. And the amazing thing is, is that he did this willingly. There, there's even evidence in the scriptures that he volunteered to go. Like, kind of like Isaiah did in Isaiah 6. He says, who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here am I, send me. The Lord went willingly to take the blow for us. There's no evidence in the, in the gospels of God driving him or, or him forcing the son. Or the, uh, Jesus did this willingly for us at the final moment he said not my will but yours be done and finally he he at the at the final moment he submitted himself to the will of the father and went to the cross we need to understand why he suffered let's be clear about this why the lord struck him it wasn't for his own sins the suffering of, of the lord jesus was for our sins the Lord struck him instead of striking us. And Isaiah is showing us how severely God punished Christ for our sins. I think this is written so vividly so that we will take sin seriously and repent of our sin. We need to understand and perceive our wretchedness and the sinfulness of our sin so that we will seek the cure that has been provided in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen to how Isaiah describes our condition in this passage. It's not flattering. He says we're all like sheep. It might, it might sound like he's kind of flattering. Oh, I'm a, I'm a cute little sheep. I'm a cute little woolly sheep for the Lord. No, what he's really saying is you're stupid and helpless. Apart from the Lord, we're like sheep, stupid and helpless, wandering around, witless, lost, like wandering, witless animals, doing whatever we wanted to do, going wherever we wanted to go, choosing to live as we desired, like sheep that have gone astray, dominated by natural, sinful desires. It's our nature to wander away. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. There is none righteous. No, not one. None who seek after God. They have all gone their own way. Like sheep, we have gone astray. You see, 
Most people today have a very inflated view of themselves. The going doctrine, uh, the, the, the popular doctrine today of human nature is that we're basically good people who occasionally make mistakes. And that is not what the scripture says. We are like sheep who have gone astray, stupid and helpless and wandering. Our nature to wander. Well, let's talk briefly about the results of his suffering and then I will conclude. What is the result of this vicarious death? Romans 5.1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God because God's wrath has been extinguished in Christ. We are reconciled, brought near by grace because Christ has paid the price. His death gives full, complete pardon for sin. This is not partial forgiveness. Full and complete. He saves us through his death. And so we have two choices. Every person has two choices. When it comes to our sin, we can, one, we can choose to bear our own sin. What is the result? The result is hell. Now, I know that many reject that doctrine as well. Many say that a loving God would not send anyone to hell. How do you respond to something like that? Well, actually, a loving God has provided a way for us to be saved from hell. That's how the love of God was demonstrated, in that God sent his son to bear our sin. If we reject that love, hell is the only other alternative. The other choice that we have is to let Christ be our sin bearer. Now suppose that you had a sick relative, someone that you love very dearly is sick unto death, and at great personal cost to you, you found a way for that person to be healed, and then you came and you offered them that remedy. But let's say they refused to take it. Maybe they didn't believe they were sick. Maybe they didn't get along with you and they were too proud to let you help them. If the remedy is refused, then the only other result is to suffer the consequences of the sickness. Sin is a sickness that results in death. God has offered a remedy. If this remedy is refused, death is the result. You see, true love is seen most clearly in the vicarious death of Christ. This is how God loved us. This is how God's love was demonstrated. Th this is not a cheap love. This is not a romantic love or, or just some kind of affectionate feeling. I think that most people, if you were to go out and talk to most people in America today and you were to tell them God loves you, I think a lot of people's response, they may not say this directly in these words, but, but their response would be pretty much, well, of course he does. I'm a good person. Of course God loves me. Who wouldn't love me? But you see, we really see the depths of God's love when we understand the depths of our corruption and our sin and the, and the extent to which he went to redeem us from our sin. This is not a cheap love. This is a sacrificial love. A love that costs God dearly. His only son. And it's a love that has the power to transform our hearts. Amen. This is the true love of God. That he, was a that he died a vicarious death. Let's say that someone knocked on the door of your home and told you that, that you owed a debt. And that they had paid it for you. Now your first question would be, you would probably want to know who they were and, and how you came to owe the debt. The second question might be, well, how much was the debt? Now, if the person says, well, it, 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 was, ten, it was a $10 parking ticket, that would not be a very significant gift. You would not be very impressed or overawed. You'd probably say, well, thank you very much. Have a nice day. But what if it could be shown that, in fact, you were unaware of it, but you owed millions and the penalty for not paying that debt was life in prison. And someone said to you, I've paid this debt. You don't owe a thing. 
that gift would be significant. That gift would be life-changing. In the same way, our understanding of this vicarious death of Christ helps us to see the love of God and transforms our hearts. It's because of his death that Paul could ask this question in Romans 8. Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? The answer is that no one can charge believers with guilt because God, because Christ has paid for our sin. Now someone might ask this question as well. It might not seem right for Jesus to take the punishment for our sin. Someone will ask, well, how is that even possible that, that Jesus being innocent would take the punishment for our sins? That doesn't seem fair. How does this work? How is it that Jesus, God can punish Christ and then let, off, let us go free on the basis of that punishment? The answer is found in the biblical concept of federal headship. Now, Brother Given has developed this doctrine. I think many of you have heard his teaching on this. A federal head is a single man who represents many other men. In Scripture, there are two federal heads. One is Adam and the other is Christ. Adam represents all human beings born into this world. As it says in Chronicles of Narnia, we're all sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. We're human. And because he's the father of our race, we inherit his characteristics. Adam has passed on his characteristics to his children. Those characteristics being sin and death. All of this is found in Romans 5, by the way. If we stand in solidarity with Adam, if we're united with him then we will be marked by sin and death. But Christ, on the other hand, represents a whole new race of men. Christ's race is marked by righteousness and eternal life. If we stand in solidarity with Christ, then we will take after him. This solidarity in Scripture is called being in Christ. We are actually united with him in his death and resurrection so that we benefit from all he has done, including his vicarious death. We become united with him. That's why Jesus said in John 6, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. You have to become so united with me that there's almost no distinction between me and you. You see, this, this vicarious sacrifice has to be personally appropriated. It has to be received, in other words. And that is done by being united with Christ. You have to get close enough to Jesus to benefit from his accomplishments. C.S. Lewis wrote in Mere Christianity that Jesus came into the world to infect the human race with his life. But this is not an infection that's caught by everyone by accident. We must receive it. We must let his life penetrate into our souls to the point that it can be said that we have died and our lives are hid with Christ in God. And so those who benefit from Christ's vicarious death are those who appropriate it by faith in union with Jesus Christ. When Jesus stood on trial before Pilate, there was a man named Barabbas who was brought forth. We don't know much about this man. We know his name and we know that he was guilty of insurrection and murder and was being held to be executed. And surely Barabbas deserved to die. He was not a good man. He was not a worthy man. But we read in the Gospels that the leaders of the Jewish people asked Pilate to let Barabbas go free and and instead... To crucify Jesus. Now I read the Bible for years and I read over that little detail about Barabbas until I was one day reading a a sermon by Charles Spurgeon. And in the sermon Spurgeon said that we are all Barabbas. We were guilty. We deserved to die. But Jesus was put to death instead of us. And we have been set free So let us receive that pardon and live for Jesus. He died a vicarious death. Praise the Lord. 